Well, hello, Barbara Brooks, 53. We always like to say that and with Second Act Women. And we would like to introduce, this is actually going to be a really wonderful session that we're doing with a six-time Emmy award-winning journalist, Jessica Rowe, who I just learned actually also was one of the producers of, of, of uh, Dateline. So she, I have some questions for her on that one. That's a whole nother story. Anyhow, today we are talking about how to land your media pitch in today's very, very unique journalism world. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Jessica Rowe, who is right here in Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Jessica. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I'm honored to be able to share with you some of the stuff that I know. And my whole point with uh, this presentation is uh, my goal is to hopefully allow you to learn some of the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to television news and print media, uh, which will help you figure out how to best get your PR pitches in the door. Uh, because I've seen a lot of people do stuff great, and then I've seen more people do stuff wrong. And there is a right and a wrong way about it. But the way that you think you're doing it right is actually, in most cases, the not right way. So I I am super excited to just kind of share with you some of these things. So sure, the title um, of the presentation is How to Land Your Media Pitch in Today's Unique Journalism World. Again, my name is Jessica Rowe. Um, in today's discussion, what I'd like to have you kind of ask yourself is, you know, am I shooting and missing or am I landing it, you know, exactly where it should be? Uh, the main questions we're going to ask ourselves is, is what I'm pitching newsworthy? Is it an actual story that I'm asking a journalist to cover? Um, what relationships have I built with that journalist? Is it actually worth cashing in a media token? Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit. Will this help or hurt my credibility with the journalist? Because there are ways you might actually hurt your credibility with the journalist. And is there truly a win or a payoff for my client? And if not, what are the other options? Because there actually are other options. Uh, just quick about me, sorry I put a bunch of numbers up here, dates, but um, I just did start in TV news uh, pretty much right after I graduated from high school because I started at the campus television station at CSU, uh, but the very next year I was employed by KMGH in Denver doing some weekend writing and weekend assignment editing. So I jumped from there to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I pretty much have always stuck with NBC stations. So from NBC, New Mexico, I was on to NBC San Francisco, which I still, in my heart, it's probably one of my face, favorite places that I ever worked. It, uh, it is uh, interesting. Television markets are broken up into the size of how far the rabbit ear signals, yes, believe it or not, they still use rabbit ear signals, uh, can reach to, uh, to how many households. And so the top 10, it's like New York, LA, but San Francisco is the number five market in the country. So it was just an honor to have worked there for about six years. Uh, we moved back after the 9-11 um, episode because we lived in Marin County and crossing that, that uh, Golden Gate Bridge, sitting on it while it swayed and men with machine guns would have to uh, go through our trunk every single time you went each way was you know an hour and a half just to get across the bridge one way so it was not a very good quality of life so we came back to denver um and you know i eventually joined nine news in the uh, executive producer category so i did that until 2007 um and then i took a chance and i was the ceo of an international nonprofit. love that it was kind of a debbie downer type uh, uh, assignment but uh it, it was it was very um, rewarding, I should say. I did Marcom and HR for a law firm, uh, and then followed one of the partners at the law firm over to the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Um, moved up then to the Chief Communications Officer at the Governor's Office under Hickenlooper, and then I kind of went back to TV again. And um, you know, up until this last job, I've pretty much been freelancing for NBC News at the network level, where I have been working for Dateline and. Uh, you know, online, whether it's uh, MSNBC or uh, uh, the Today Show, I, I, I performed what 
most people uh, who are freelancers are, which is called booking. And it's funny um, because that's what led me to my next job, which is I thought, you know, um, I was sitting on some Dateline trials, uh, some here in Colorado, and I was thinking, you know, they keep bringing these private investigators up to the stand and they don't seem like they're super, super brilliant. And yet they're solving the cases. You know, it, it's like it's down to whether you, the, the jury believes one private investigator or the other private investigator. And I was like, I think I can do that. Like, you know, it's exactly what I'm doing for Dateline is digging up all this information and, uh, you know, presenting it to in a certain way. And so I just thought on a whim, I'm going to apply for that. I'm going to research how to do it. And it was literally quite seriously, what I was already doing as a journalist was, you know, finding facts. Uh, so my firm is called The Fact Firm. Uh, dot com. And uh, I still, you know, dabble in it a little bit. But um, after a couple years, I decided, you know, I think I'm going to get my law degree. So randomly, I went to DU a couple years ago, and I uh, got my master's of law. It's a new degree. I highly encourage anybody interested in law to consider that. Um, it's uh, two years instead of three. You're treated as an equal student, as a master's student with uh, JD candidates. Your professors have no idea your master's versus JD. And most recently, I've joined Deloitte. And so I do something similar in journalism, which is a FOIA legal analyst. That means I oversee the Freedom of Information Act documents that the federal government has to release to the public. Um, and I kind of have a final stamp on whether or not there are things that uh, journalists can uh, have access to. So I do that, but on the side, I just can't keep my uh, hands off writing and stuff. So I freelance report for a local newspaper, The Villager. And then um, I'm expecting in the winter uh, to teach media law back at DU. So that's sort of my uh, current sort of scope of things. And I dabble in other things too. I'm kind of one of those people who just kind of needs to stay busy and stay inspired. So uh, probably TMI for all that, but just want to let you know, I'm kind of all all over the place and yet the one thing that's in common is journalism is always in my heart um, but the thing is is one thing is very important with all this and that is that um, you have to remain no matter what you're doing as a PR professional a connector an influencer a powerhouse and essentially you got to be a media maven ladies um, these are you know being a networker is how you become a super successful uh, public relations person because you can't let any of these relationships uh, go uh, cold for too long these are the people who you will be tapping when it comes to getting your story on the news whether it's your actual story or one you're working with a client so what we're going to learn is um, whether your pitches have been landing in the circular file, and we call that uh, just meaning the trash can, why there are only a few sure ways to get journalists' attention, and which, which journalists' uh, attention you need, here I probably did this S's apostrophes wrong, but anyway, uh, why you need, uh, which journalist attention you need to get, and the title, believe it or not, of reporter or anchor, which is probably where you've been aiming, is not always the person who decides the, what makes the cut. In fact, generally, they are not the person who decides what makes the cut for the newscast. Uh, and whether you have an actual valid need for the media or whether you're actually wasting their time. So um, diving right in, I wanted to start with saying, um, you know, this job as a PR professional, it, you are the pitcher. You are strategically placing content in the news. You are working on behalf of a client most of the time. Uh, and as you've probably felt like a salesperson, you technically are a salesperson. And I understand this is very far from an easy job. So I just want to acknowledge that um, it, it is not easy. Um, but I want to make sure that you are honest with yourself. You have to ask yourself when you're trying to pitch to the media, can you, as the PR person, truly get behind this pitch with passion? Like, would you buy this if you're selling this? And be honest with yourself. Um, you know, over on the side, I put she believed she could, so she did. You know, if you don't believe in this thing and the answer is no, you need to change course. Um, imagine yourself as the receiver. It, you know, if you're trying to put on a smile for this, this pitch that you're making, 
And then you go home and you're like, oh my God, thank God that's over. At least I did what the client wanted me to and pitched it. That you, you just wasted a relationship token because that person might think you really are authentic with this, but you're not, you know, it, it's, you wasted that one time you could get that reporter that you, you know now, cause you have an established relationship and you know, they're going to second guess whether to receive something from you again. Um, they, they will say no, or more cases than not, they're going to just ghost you. They're going to ignore you altogether and you will burn that bridge. So I'm just, uh, warning you. I really ask you to be authentic when you are pitching something to the media. Um, and keep in mind, um, be respectful, uh, be a respectful story pick picture. Their time as journalists, whether they are in print broadcast, online media, trade magazines, whatever, their time's tight. Their pressure that they are under is immense. They are the type who do not start at 9 a.m. and get out at 5 p.m. These people, kind of just like I was explaining everything I do, I work 24 hours a day still. And that is because you know, I answer texts in the middle of the night. I answer the phone in the middle of the night. If I hear somebody message me, I, I get up. It is not because I am uh, desperate for conversations. It is because I have been the executive producer who at, you know, 2 a.m. I will have a morning producer text me and say, I have diarrhea. I've got to go home. And if I, myself, don't find somebody else to go in and cover that person's show, well, then Gary and Kyle are going to show up and there's going to be no show to have, you know, to show, to produce. They're just going to have to ad lib for two or four hours. So I'm used to having, you know, to be that person who just jumps out of bed, throws on a ball cap and goes in and does that work and probably stays through my entire next shift. It is um, something that you just get used to. And like I said, the pressure is immense. If I already had a meeting scheduled that day with my general manager, uh, he, he, he didn't really care that I had a, you know, text at 2 a.m. and had, was in by three. Uh, that's, you know, I wasn't a hero to him. That's part of my job getting that show on the air that morning. And uh, so I need to actually probably look a little better than a ball cap by the time I, I meet with him. It is a very, very tough, tough business. And you are constantly reminded at every station, at every newspaper, that there are people who want your job and you know, you're getting paid what you're getting paid. Don't ask for raises because you're lucky to do this. Um, so just keep in mind, those are the type of conditions that they work under. Uh, and it is, it is challenging because they have a passion for doing this or else they wouldn't work in these conditions. Um, uh, you know, even now I freelance, I hardly get paid anything for what I'm doing, but I love what I'm doing. It's so fun to interview people, to have like that access to people and that power to ask the questions to people who are very important. Um, and then be able to show them the fi final product. And then they're just like glowing with admiration, even though that like paycheck is like nothing, you know, it, it's still so fun. Um, so what I would say is when it comes to who makes the decisions on which, what stories get greenlit, it's people you'll never meet. So let me tell you, there are editorial tables. Um, they're not as uh, fancy as this uh, uh, iPhoto, iStock photo that I got here. But they are the assignment editors. The assignment editors weed through all of those press releases you've sent into their desks. So if they found one that looks like blah, didn't even, it doesn't even make it to the editorial table. And right now, as you can imagine, those editorial tables, uh, generally they have a nine o'clock meeting and a two o'clock meeting every day uh, for both TV and print. Those, uh, those press releases, most of them don't even make it to this meeting because if they can't see a story in it, a person in that story, they're not gonna bring it there. So it's your job now to turn around those press releases and uh, get them there a different way, which I'll explain. So assignment editors are the first place where your story can get dropped. Line producers, if they don't like that story, because they already kind of have in mind, okay, I've got to go with the COVID-19 story. I've got to go with the sidebar that's kind of creeping up. 
um, and then executive producers, they're the ones who are going to say, I'm managing four shows today. Guys, I can't have the same lead at this hour as I do at this hour as I do at this hour. So one of you's got to give up one of those stories. They're the ones who are going to decide which show leads with which story. And by default, the, the, those producers and those reporters get shuffled around. News directors are the final say in the newsroom. And they are the ones who will decide what reporters are working on what stories and whether, whether those reporters are even employed there. So generally, news directors are the top bosses in every newsroom, and they are very hard to um, get access to. Um, I've been a news director at an NBC station, and I will tell you, you would not believe how people try and weasel their way into uh, getting you know, your cell phone or whatever. It, it's really quite crazy. Um, and then there are also people like, you know, at, at Nine Wants to Know, my best friend is Nicole Rapp. She's the executive producer of Nine Wants to Know. She's been there forever, 20 something years, and she'll probably stay there until she dies. She is very passionate about that job and she loves training journalists on how to do investigative journalism. Uh, so if she walks in the room at the editorial table and says, hi, I've been working on something for eight weeks. This is sometimes the first time anybody at that editorial table has any clue that her team's been working on this something because it's, you know, they can't let it out. If, if they have anybody else knowing that they're working on this, then rumors get started. Uh, information gets leaked, that type, type of thing. So she will drop that bomb on there. And then all of a sudden, you know, it might rise above COVID-19 today for the lead because it's that big of a deal. One uh, of those stories would be, uh, you know, her or KCNC in the last few weeks when they, when they uncovered that Denver Health was paying all of those uh, C-suite people, you know, million dollars or more. And on top of that, here's, you know, a $200,000, you know, uh, bonus and and the, nobody really liked to hear that when everybody else is unemployed and blah 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 and their excuses are well they were budgeted yeah but can't you plan around and change a budget when you're also asking people who are working and dying next to the the dying covid people to maybe like move that money around it, it's just it's just an eyesore it's just unbelievable so those are stories that in rare instances, get up moved above what you would think is the obvious uh, top story of the day. Uh, there are times, though, when the general manager or the corporate president will say, this is the story. It's very, very, very rare. Those people are generally hand off, heads, hands off. But um, when it comes to print media, the equivalent would be, as I have on the bottom here, the hedge fund capital investors who own the Denver Post. They've made some horrible decisions. No one in the newsroom is a fan of those people because they've cut the staff and all the people in the newsroom have to do, you know, 20 times as much as they used to do. And that means a lot less writing, a lot less journalism. So uh, just to give you an idea there, it is uh, a very interesting concept when it comes to who is making the decisions. It is not the reporter that you are actually getting to uh, reach out to. The reporter has to take your story and go sell it to the people who will decide if it makes a newscast, if that makes sense. When it comes to um, recognizing what a TV journalist job entails, oh, actually, this is my friend, Nicole Vapp there with An Andrea Mitchell. I want to kind of put into uh, concept here that I'm, I'm explaining to you that the stories that you're pitching have to involve stories with people. And you can't come to a station and, or, or a newspaper and say, I've got this thing and it's unveiling today and it's really cool technology, blah, blah, blah. Okay, instead, you gotta tell me, how does this thing affect people? What are the visuals you're gonna provide me with? Who am I able to interview? You know, and your answer can't be like, oh, let me get back to you. Cause they're gonna say, yeah, I, 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 have, to, I have to turn something today. So if you don't have that ready for me right now, your story's out, out of a question. So you have to come to them with all of these things ready when you are ready to pitch a story. Again, visuals, interviews, people uh, on the day the story's pitched. So these stories generally involve a problem. Think about this. You need to present, you know, here's a problem and why. I now have a solution and I want you to hear about it. Or 
we're in search of a solution or making a call to action, or in some cases, a happy ending is a great story as well. And with each story, journalists are tasked with many layers of this. So think about it. A journalist in uh, TV will have to turn many, many layers. And uh, sometimes if you can think of different layers, it helps the journalist to realize, oh, I have to do a version of this story at four and at six and at nine. And it's kind of cool because they can reveal a new little tidbit in each show. So if you're able to think ahead that much, they love this. Um, and what I mean by that is they're going to do a stand-up tease, okay? That's required for most everybody. They're also going to do a voiceover tease promotion. They're also going to do a social media, folks. To, and what that is, is uh, what uh, we talked about a little bit yesterday with Barbara, is they're going to do a tease to say, come watch this at 4, 5, 6, 9, or 10 p.m. Uh, and that's saying we want you to make an appointment to watch our television. So that phrase appointment television is a very big phrase within uh, television news. And then uh, you have the actual story, which may include a live shot. And um, then, you know, it goes on the website, which lives infinitely on the web. And that, if you get that level of press, you've earned a golden ticket of free press. So you have to ask yourself, is the story you're pitching, does it deliver all of these things? Uh, okay, so moving on, when it comes to a newspaper journalist, um, they are doing several stories at once, not just one. Uh, generally, news TV people are, are, you know, sometimes doing two, but most of the time doing one a day. And uh, newspaper journalists are doing six in every, any given day. Some might be on the back burner, they're still investigating them, that you, you know, they're evergreen such as features and um, investigative pieces. But they are, you know, they're the first ones dispatched when they hear of uh, something on the scanner, which actually is hard to hear nowadays because all of the agencies have turned, have encrypted their scanners. Um, so frankly, people who send in news tips are the way that they find out quite a bit of the information that they uh, learn about things and go out on a story. So once they arrive on the scene, that one person is generally the photographer, the reporter, and uh, the, the writer of that story. Um, and you know, you might hear people call somebody a reporter. In newspaper, it's very common for them to use the term, I'm still reporting. And that means, what reporting means, tech, journal, uh, TV journalists don't use this a lot, but uh, print journalists say, I'm still reporting. That means I'm still gathering the facts. I've not finished the story and I don't have the answer yet to what this story is. So if they say I'm still reporting on it, that's what they're saying. Uh, anyway, they're sending in photographs. They're sending in a web brief for this scene and they have to write it. It's not like they're calling in and somebody back at base is writing it for them. They're having to do all this work. You will see print journalists sitting at Starbucks. You will see them sitting outside a public building to get Wi-Fi. They, were, they, they will write in their car. It is very, very hard. And then eventually the final version goes to uh, the editor who makes adjustments or asks them a couple questions if they have any. The biggest question is generally, do you have two sources on that? Because, uh, and, and oftentimes the journalist will give the editor who their two sources are, but just between them, that those are the only two people who know who the two sources are, because uh, it's a very coveted thing as a journalist to not reveal your sources. Um, and then the layout person builds the pages. And then the entire paper has to be, oops, sorry, I've got a typo there, must uh, be to the press by midnight. So, I mean, I'm sorry, it, it, by 10 p.m. actually, because it goes to the press by midnight and then it's printing to get to your doorstep or wherever it lands. So magazine journalists, I want you to start thinking a little bit more if you have more specific things that are industry related for those people you're representing, because those journalists are writing today for a story that publishes a month from now, six weeks from now. They're generally juggling five to seven pieces at once, and they can take on more stories um, because here's the deal. Most of these magazine journalists aren't employed by the magazine. They're freelance journalists. And the more story ideas they have in the hopper, the more money they can make. So a good idea that comes to them means money to them. And it's helpful if they get the idea and then they are able to go pitch it. So I think a lot of people underestimate the, the value of a magazine journalist. 
uh, to be perfectly honest, because trade magazines, trade journalists, you know, if you find something that you like on the web or whatever magazine, you know, Vanity Fair, um, you know, uh, the, the New York, uh, the New Yorker, that sort of thing, Google that person's byline on the web, you'll see they write for several different publications in a lot of cases. And, and consider um, one thing, and I kind of blew past that, but you need to know what these people their, what their type of content is, you know, um, and that's, that's sort of where it comes to the relationship building is that you need to have established these relationships with reporters far before you're ever going to ask them for help. When it comes to everyday media, these are not news. These things here are not news that they uh, um, want to cover. Uh, new hires, buyers, Product launches, version 2.0s, recalls, grants, big check awards, ribbon cuttings. Um, you know, Nine News has a blatant rule. We do not cover big checks or ribbon cuttings. Here's the exceptions. Okay, you got a state lottery winner and it's like a huge jackpot. Yeah, we're going to cover that. That's pretty interesting. Uh, recalls. Okay, that sounds boring, but recalls that involve deaths and there's a story, a story to go along with that. We're going to cover that. Uh, ribbon cuttings on a huge city building or a rebuild that burned on a building that burned down that has a story to go along with it. Yeah. Or even today, Senator Burr stepping down from the intelligence committee uh, because he's accused of insider trading. Yeah, that that is a new hire fire type umbrella that absolutely is going to be covered, you know. All right. Um, but if you find that what you're pushing is not a story, just stop. Just take a deep breath, stop, and say, I think this is not a story. I think this is something I need to talk to my client and go about it in a different way. And there are different ways. So here's what I'd suggest. Think about your other options. Pivot. Think about social media. Um, ask them for access to their social media account. Uh, generally, they'll give it to you. I mean, you, or, or at least you could be sending over the scripts for social media. So get your move on and make this a social media promotion that travels. Uh, the people who are following your company's social media, um, not your PR company, but the company you're working for, those who are already following the company's social media account are interested. They, they're following it and they liked it because they're interested in that company. So when you post something about a big deal there, yeah, they're going to see it in their newsfeed. So they want to see it and they're, they're going to digest that. Um, you can drum up polls there. People like taking polls. Whatever it is, uh, consider doing something social media. Um, you can also reevaluate if you can find a way to make this a story. You know, go back to the whiteboard. Are you missing the story element? Maybe did the company give you something to pitch and yet you need to go back to them and say, I need a person in this story. I need visuals in this story. Can we talk about this? Uh, don't, don't go away with just what they gave you if it's not a story. Um, think about something. Uh, I wrote an article this week for a paper and uh, it was a standalone great article. It was about how in Arapahoe County, a very young sheriff, he was only 36 years old at the time, his name's Sheriff Tyler Brown, was uh, ran for sheriff. And the incumbent, everybody loved the incumbent. He was a Republican, Arapahoe County for a while there was very red. And every, I mean, officers were doing things officers aren't supposed to do, which is telling their friends on Facebook, hey, please, 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 when you vote, vote for the incumbent. You know, he's great. Well, remember the blue wave in 18? People were just going Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. They were picking blue people all along. So guess who got elected and the red, and the red incumbent got booted out? A random sheriff who was 37 years old, who's never even been an Arapahoe County deputy. He's just been a Mountain View police officer who threw his name in the hat and people were livid. I mean, they were like, how is this even allowed? I mean, they were so pissed off. Well, 18 months in, it is a, it's like a love story. People in Arapahoe County, even all those Republicans love this sheriff because he came in and he said, I'm young, I want to learn, and I want to keep everybody in place other than the guy who's leaving, the sheriff. 
and I want you to teach me. And it was this wonderful story um, that I just had the privilege to write about how, you know, if you, if you do things the right way, you can bring people around. So I said, you know, he went from feeling skepticism to now feeling praise. Um, so in other words, timing related, I was able to roll this out this week because it's like national celebrated cop week or something like that. There wasn't other, really any other timing, but um, somebody pitched the story to me and I said, yeah, and you know what? There's like a good angle to bring this out. And so uh, celebrating law enforcement was a really good angle to do this story. So worked out good, you know? So if you can think of something in the news um, or, you know, Google things that you can almost always get an angle in the news that can help you with your pitch. Um, and lastly, just re meet with your client and say, you know, I just don't think it's an appropriate story to pitch to the press, but um, I can do other things with it and, and think about, you know, what other things as we've discussed here that might work. So what I really, really want to stress on you is how do I reach the press? Uh, you don't cold call them. You don't, uh, send emails if you've never met them. You have already worked with relationships. So I recommend you get to know these members of the press that you believe you're gonna be working with. Follow them, first go on the websites and say, what type of stories do I like that are being told? Which reporters uh, tell stories in the way that I understand the way they tell them? And I like that they give fair coverage. Watch them, follow them on Facebook, start liking their stories, start commenting on their stories. And then before or not, a lot of these people really read all those comments because they really care what people think about their journalism and you're suddenly interacting with them. So then when you go to pitch them a story, your name is in their ear. They can't figure out why in their earworm they remember you, but you know, then it, then it hits them. They've, they already sort of know who you are. And that's a good way to really, that's actually the best way is through relationships. So you already have known these members of the press. Um, and I find that that's the best way to, you know, pitch stories is you already have a relationship. Um, you know, you, members of the press cannot accept anything over $25. So don't be sending them flowers. Don't be sending them gift cards. They have to send them back. It's, it's really embarrassing because uh, trust me, they're poor. They don't get paid enough. They'd love to take your Jimmy John's card and go eat lunch, trust me, but they can't. So um, you can't do that. Instead, you know, you could say, hey, want to meet for a cup of, cup of coffee? I'd love to pitch a story or something. And time is tight, so some of them don't have time to do those things. But, you know, think of a way. There's always something that um, you can figure out. And so, again, avoid sending press releases, but the ones that do make it into the hands and that are brought to editorial tables are the ones from the governor, you know, who's talking about, hey, uh, I'm, I'm working on a story right now. Our pool's going to be open for the summer. Surprise! not at least until June 1st, okay? So the governor, CDPHE, those press releases are important to me, but uh, the health department, the city, those are all important. Anything else, yeah, they get ignored unless it's, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, press conferences that they, they're obligated to go to. And nowadays, press in Denver, they only send one person and then they, 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 they pull it is what it's called. They do a press pull. They do not all go to the same thing and waste a cameraman and a reporter. They literally just have the video fed into one central place and then it's distributed back to all of the different stations. And the bottom line is all these reporters want is an exclusive. If they can get an exclusive story and they can go, boss, I got this great story. It's ours if we want it. What do you think? If you can promise them an exclusive story, you're gonna get more airtime for that exclusive story because exclusive means promotions. Promotions means they're gonna do a promotion in the early afternoon, they're gonna do a promotion in prime time, and they're gonna hold it for the B block. And uh, I think I'll get to that in a second here. So, um, oh yeah, I do, that's right what I do here. Uh, the most coveted location for a TV uh, story is the first story in the second block after the first commercial, because this means it's the story they will have been promoting during prime time. It is such a good story. They believe people will stay up longer, even if they're frustrated because they wanted to go to bed after they heard the first weathercast and they're going to stick around and see it. And uh, when it comes to print, it's the front page story with a, a jump page. Uh, above the fold of the front paper is always best, but anywhere on the front page, it's ideal to have such a news and timely angle that you're selling the story that gets top billing. 
Um, so I have, I, I worked on this press release with somebody in the room here. And this was an example of a original press release. And um, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with this press release other than if I was receiving it, I would say um, that it talks about this company and it's an app company that is engaging in helping families communicate with senior care teams during COVID-19. You know, basically it's the interface. It's like the, um, maybe on an iPad, an app on an iPad, something like that, um, that's helping families connect face-to-face, -face, uh, but it is also HIPAA compliant, which is very important in these hospitals and any family care, any hospital care setting. And um, it talks a lot about here in the beginning, you know, uh, a lot of, the HIPAA stuff, okay? But if I'm receiving this press release, what I wanna hear more is in a email to me who might get this as an exclusive because I don't think that multiple stations are gonna pick this up and say, oh, we gotta do this story. I don't think a spread of this press release is gonna go to se several stations and they're all gonna pick it up. I don't know, maybe it did. So somebody here will have to tell me that. But the way I redid it is just in an email. And I said, you know, I want to reach out to share a story about a woman-owned SaaS company. There's different words you can, you know, get in there. Um, okay, believe it or not, until I left TV news for a little bit in 2007, I would have never even known what a SaaS company is. So you have to remember your journalists are not experts on high tech. They are not experts on everything. They are minimalist, knowledgeable about everything. Okay. But even I probably shouldn't have left the word SAS in there because that's not something I learned until I went and worked for the governor's IT office. Um, anyway, uh, so I kind of put it in simple, simple terms. You know, she experienced this. So now I'm saying I have a story to tell you about this woman, why she created this to solve a problem while her dad was in care. She found outdated communication. It was an issue. And it's one of the only HIPAA compliant SASs with the technology to help with care teams. You know, it's, it's actually totally different than Zoom, Skype, and FaceTime. Um, and this thing is designed to give family members immediate access to staff, and here's why. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, you'd follow the next paragraph and say something like, I've got a family ready to talk, I've got the, oh, the uh, creator ready to talk, and I've got somebody at the care facility ready to talk. So something like that is going to be a much better, like, story, because if the, let's say the assignment uh, editor gets this on the uh, email inbox, you know, they're going to go, huh, this looks like a story and it's just for us or just for me, you know, they're going to go, um, you know, Anna, can you look at this and make some calls? See if this is a story that for sure is just uh, exclusive to us. And then they will, because that reporter is coming through the door and looking for a story to pitch because generally that's their first job every day is pitching a story. So oftentimes, you know, what you pitch them today is a story they're going to do tomorrow generally. So anyway, um, I'm at the point where I just kind of wanted to leave you with some main takeaways, and that is that, uh, you know, establishing press relationships is the most important thing. Figuring out whether this is a story is also very important, and knowing when to pivot is also um, something you got to come to grips with.